Hey, Sheila, welcome to the show as a way of getting started. Give us a little background on yourself. Um, hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to meet you because you've been joining me on my daily COVID walks. <laughs> I like to listen to what you have to say. It really resonates with me. Yeah. So hope you haven't been laughing too loud and uh, <laughs> jeopardizing your fellow <laughs> walkers. No, I think, I think we have it uh, under control. But um, so since this is the truth about sales, I would say that I began my sales career in more like B to C um, as a Girl Scout selling cookies. It's been quite a while since then. Yeah. And, then uh, and then I sold retail in high school and college just to save up for college money. But I didn't really, I did not have exposure to sales growing up. Um, and I honestly didn't know what I wanted to be. Uh, so I thought I wanted to be an architect and went to engineering school and uh, realized that Maybe that wasn't for me. I appreciate it, but I didn't have a gift. So I, when I got out of school, my goal was to find a blue chip company that would provide me with some sort of baseline training and help me figure out what I wanted to do, frankly. Yeah. And, um, and I was fortunate enough to have that experience with GE, General Electric, which was a you know very prestigious uh, company at the time, and um, and I joined their commercial training program, which is a rotation program that uh, exposes you to technical sales, uh, product marketing, uh, marketing research, and through that exposure and through encouragement of. Um, some of the bosses, I ended up moving to technical sales. So it was not at all um, something that I you know, was encouraged to do by my parents. My father was a scientist. My mother was a school teacher. They thought sales was not necessarily a respectable profession. Yeah. So, um, but it was, um, it worked for me. And um, I hesitated to be honest because um, even with all that exposure to salespeople, I felt that I wasn't sure if my personality was a match. I was a little bit shy and um, didn't play golf. And in those days, it seemed like that's what salespeople did. So, and, uh, so what was it like when you got into it? So, um, so I ended up in industrial sales. Um, I was hired by one of my rotation managers and he moved me to California, actually. I was um, in the Midwest at the time, and uh, although I grew up out East. And um, at that time, there were only 5% women in that business. So that alone was um, an experience. And... Uh, <laughs> And I was very young and, and frankly, in hindsight, probably immature, but um, that's what happens. And, but I had a really great leader who I think uh, exposed me to a lot. We, there was no sales training in those days for that particular business, but he, and so he was trying to get me into some sort of external sales program and everything was booked. Yeah. So he was very creative, I think. He found a class for purchasing people. And I was, that sale was to manufacturing and engineering leaders, but purchasing ultimately was, you know, who we dealt with. Yeah. And I, to this day, that experience informed me because I got to put myself in the shoes of the customer. So I was being trained the way the customer was being trained. Yeah. And I, I don't know if he realized the power of that decision, but it was really impactful. So I, th I think the other lesson in that particular role was, um, well, first of all, it was a very consultative sale. It was very much about problem solving. And I continue to maintain that kind of style in my selling and in and i look for those kinds of people when i hire um 
And I'm trying to think, he also gave me some very candid feedback. I think a lot of people don't get, you know, uncomfortable feedback at a, an early stage in their life. And so they go on either making mistakes or, or just either thinking they're behaving a certain way. And um, I mean, we all have maybe nervous habits that we sure don't do. realize. Yeah, and, blind uh, spots. Yeah, and in that particular case, I, I still can't believe this. Um, he went on a sales call with me and, and um, after the call, he said, you know, do you know that you giggle when you're nervous? I, I didn't even know I was doing it. Yeah. I, I was young and nervous. And right, it wasn't was conscious. Father. Right, right. So, so one of the lessons there was to, to gently, I think, guide people that have those nervous habits early on in their career um, and help them be more successful. And how did you take it at first? Were you all put off by it? Were you offended? Did you? Um, I, I didn't. Initially, I don't think I almost believed it because I didn't Denial. even notice. Yeah. Yeah. It's like people that say things now, you know, or, you know, they, they have fillers, I call them. Yep. And they're really just nervousness. Totally, of, actually, yeah. precisely, exactly. Yeah. 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 And as you know, a lot of people don't, or they're not comfortable with silence. Right. So that was my filler for giggling, yeah. pausing. So, so it's fascinating to me so many years ago that, you know, small bits of feedback have carried me through my career. Um, he also taught me how to write a really good letter. And, uh, and I, to this day, um, I think that, you know, writing a great cover letter that um, really spells out the value propositions is invaluable. Because people don't sit there in one room and make instant decisions in a B2B, cons you know, no, no. big sale, right? They got a group of people, your email is going to be floating around the company. And if it's meaningless, and if it doesn't tell people why they should buy from you, then why would you make them go through the work for you, yeah. right? And how long did it take you to accept that feedback as genuine? Because he wasn't trying to hurt your feelings. Right, right. Uh, no, I, I think once I was aware of it, yeah. I got it. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I still, because sometimes I give people feedback now and I could tell they're a little hurt. It's, it's a lot about, you know, how you give it to, but I will use that as an example as, you know, to show someone some vulnerability. I too had things I had to overcome. We all do. Yeah, right. And, and hearing it when you were young versus 10, 15 plus years later. Right, right. Yeah, because and he, all, yeah, he gave me good context. I was young. I looked 17, I swear. I looked extra young. I was tiny, I was super petite, and I was a woman. Um, and all of those things were probably considered negatives in certain ways at that time. So I, I remember having a customer tell me in that first sales job, a year later when he finally bought, he said, you know, I made you wait longer because I didn't want anyone to say that I bought from you because you were a woman. So, so it may have gotten me in the door, but then I still had to earn it. And I think it's a, it's a sensitive topic, but we all have pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And that, that's, are we going to change the way the world is? We got to kind of like work. Exactly. Around it. Yes. I really believe that our strengths are also our weaknesses. Yeah. We, we have to figure out how to develop the strengths and minimize the weaknesses and you know, excel through that. So, you know, self-awareness, I think, is a really big attribute that is valuable in salespeople, but in all people. And it's 
sometimes it doesn't develop till we're a little bit more seasoned. Yeah. And how long did it take before you felt at home in sales? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that um, I developed confidence over time. Yeah. I think I hit it really pr pretty well. Well, now and I will see, but I, I was probably less confident than a lot of my peers and I hit it. And I also was quieter than a lot of my peers. Um, GE was a very high testosterone environment in those years. And, um, and a lot of my peers were much more ambitious. I never really wanted to run a company or I, I was, I wanted to climb the corporate ladder, but I wasn't in any rush to get there. Yeah. Um, I was more about doing things that were interesting to me where I could actually make an impact and in where the job kind of fit who I am. So, um, um, the next job I, I ended up going to GE plastics and I was, um, super interested in, in that role because it was a Japanese transnational role and um, I was interested in other cultures in a more global role. And in, in both of those, in, in industrial sales and in plastics, I was starting a new vertical for them. So it was always something different. I always asked for the more challenging roles. I thought the vanilla sales jobs would be boring for me. Yeah. So, and that's what's good about a bigger company is that there's yes. diff different angles that you can take. Yes, yes, yes. And, and I, I always, I really encourage younger people, frankly, to, um, to start at a bigger company if they can get one that'll train you and expose you because um, there are only so many places you can go in a smaller company unless it scales really quickly. So, yeah, especially if you don't know what you want. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And then the, the other thing that was kind of lucky for me at, um, at GE Plastics and then in other roles in my life, frankly, is when I start the verticals, I become, I kind of crack the code on how to sell in that space, yeah. then uh, it's natural for me to get that leadership role. Right. Um, and it moved me to several times in my career, including this particular company, I ended up being a player coach, um, which is not a job for everyone. No. I'll be, in fact, it's probably not a job for, for most people. Um, it's kind of like you have your, your feet in two places. Yeah. As you know, a lot of salespeople are not good leaders and vice versa. And um, I really like both, so I'm unusual. Um, I've been accused of liking the leadership role, but preferring the compensation plan for an individual contributor. Oh, crazy, isn't it? <laughs> you're, you're the only one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so original, right? <laughs> Well, that's it. You, you say like, wow, I, I like leading and, and helping people and building this, but sure do miss those big bonus checks. Yeah, exactly. So I've tended to like hop back and forth, which I know is not common. Um, the GE structure was, we called it the zigzag approach where you sometimes it was moving from the manufacturing to the field to back, yeah. you know, kind of moving up. Um, but, but what I learned from there is that there are junior sales leadership roles and there are large global sales roles that are actually bigger and more kind of leadership oriented than the junior sales role. So I, I, I tend to like the more meaty, complex sale. But, but I, I think it's important for people to expose themselves to a lot of different businesses. Um, I, I was again fortunate at GE, they moved us from business to business. Um, and so it was more about your skill set and less about your domain expertise. Yeah. And my observation in tech is not that way. Generally, a lot of companies, they want you to have the same background of that particular product, right? Yeah. 
Oh, so it really like depends, I suppose. And what, what were some of the key takeaways that you had as you progressed from a sales skills mindset standpoint? So, so you know, I learned from each one and I feel like, you know, things were done differently in the olden days, but I think I, I um, because I had to work hard for certain things, I now appreciate sales tools that exist. Like for instance, when I worked at GE Capital, which was my third GE business, um, it was uh, like 20 something years ago. And um, it was a cold calling kind of assignment. Mm -hmm. And I, I had to like sit there at a desk. I wasn't allowed to leave unless I called a hundred people. And it was, uh, we were cold calling on CFOs of major corporations. And if you can get one of those people on the phone, you better have something interesting to say because yeah. you're not going to get more than a few minutes. So you had to do your homework. I mean, we basically got that, was it Hoover's, that list of names and phone numbers. That's what I got with very little else. So we would have to call the companies and get them to mail their annual reports unless you own that stock. And so you do the homework by reviewing the annual report before you make a cold call and you may or may not reach anyone. But it sounds crazy and I'm not a fan of cold calling in today's world at all, but that's what we have to work with. And, and we had like 30 to $50 million quotas in that business. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. And, but you know, I was able to be successful there but what I was, what I really learned there is do your homework. And, and so when people today say they don't have, they don't know how to find out something about a company or a person before they reach out, I'm questioning that because I had to do it in a very different way. Yeah. Yeah. I remember having to buy directories because all you had was the main number, even finding the main number was calling right. information or something. Right. And right. You, you knew that receptionist got a, a hundred or a thousand of those calls a day. Yes. Yes. You didn't even know the name of the person you wanted to talk to. And they're like, exactly. Oh. oh my gosh. I mean, I just think that, and I could not live without Salesforce, LinkedIn. Like right. I use, we use Basecamp, um, you know, internal very, I'm not advertising for any companies, but uh, we just have so much now. I, I think mean, now the, the challenge is, is knowing what to use and when yes. and not to, it's almost too much information. It's too much now. Yeah. It's yeah. that paradox. And, you know, I remember yeah. when, you know, the internet, then Google, then LinkedIn came about. Yes. yes. I, just, I just lived on it because yes. you, you probably maybe did this where you, you'd start a new role and you'd swap spreadsheets with other reps yes. it's like, or you yes. call, yeah, you try to call through your network to try and find somebody. Yes, that's exactly. Well, I, when I started this particular role or this, in this company 12 years ago, it was again, a blank piece of paper. It was a startup. I, I was early employee and um, it's my second one. And basically the, our first few clients were through the network, through either my yep. network the founders network or the VCs network. Um, we did have LinkedIn at that point, but still the initial deals were definitely through personal warm introductions yeah. and working them. So, yeah. And, and that, that was the old social graph was we would get together, give me the top five accounts you want to get in. They'd forward it to the board. They forward it to the execs. Yes, Who do you know yes. there? Yeah. Although I, I'm really not a big believer in, in at least long-term hiring only for a Rolodex. Yeah. I still know what that means, Rolodex. Um, I, just because I think Rolodexes can get stale and, and skill sets shouldn't get stale. That's the right. way I look at it. I would prefer to, to hire people that have a certain skill set and, and capability than, you know, have, they know 20 people and then what? Right. What do you do next week? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
And what have you seen as far as distinctions between like A players and B players with reps that you've managed and led? Oh my goodness. That can be a loaded question. Um, it, a lot depends on the business I've been in actually, because there's certain things that I like to see in any business, but um, some I think are more important in like a more complex B2B sale, the bigger, the more complex sale. So um, I look for, I actually like smart people. It's not- a, No, it's you don't like dummies? <laughs> I, I like that combination of IQ and EQ. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tend to prefer people with some experience um, at this stage of my career for, for a, you know, the bigger enterprise jobs. Um, so I like, you know, I know that tenure doesn't always mean anything, but a 10 years experience, but I, I'm hoping by then that they have some judgment and that they have made enough mistakes to learn from them and are vulnerable enough to maybe share, right? right? Um, so that their ego is kind of in check, right? It's been tested a bit. Um, I still like that hunter energy, but I like substance behind that. Because some people are all about energy and positivity and then they struggle delivering right. and, and probably like everyone out there, I've definitely gotten caught on hiring some of those people. They yeah. really do well and, and then they couldn't deliver. And yeah, yeah, because just being busy right. doesn't right. do much in sales, yeah. especially right. more knowing, complex. Knowing what to do and knowing where you need help. And so, yeah. um, so some of the other things I, I tend to like problem solvers, obviously, because that's what I, how I view myself. Um, some people that have a bit of more consultative solutions, challenger, maybe maverick selling, um, but someone that, that um, is really good at listening and asking good questions. I look at, when, I, when I'm interviewing someone, I'm more concerned almost about the questions they ask me than the answers. Yeah. Because how they prepare for an interview with me informs me on how they might prepare for an important customer meeting. So, you know, do they do some research? Do they come with some creative questions? How do they approach me before and after the conversation? To me, it's super indicative of how they approach life. Yeah. So I tend to like thoughtful people. I don't mean just like writing a thank you note thoughtful. I mean like think before you speak kind of right. thoughtful. Um, and um, coachability is a big one for me. Um, and then people that hold themselves accountable. Because I hold myself accountable. That was one of the big GE cultures and I I think it's really important for again I usually hire for more senior roles to to recognize that the buck stops with you and not their fault their you know that kind of thing. You see a, a lot of that in big companies. Right, right. Um, and I, and again I yeah in a smaller company or startup, some of these attributes are super critical because you if if one person fails it could really impact the company so i find every hire super important and and then my my basic measurement in the end is would i buy from this person if i would not buy from this person i will not hire them yeah and have you made mistakes in hiring oh yeah <laughs> more than once yeah yeah, yeah i, I I want to believe the, the good. Um, I want to believe what I hear. I think sometimes I feel pressured to hire and scale fast. Right. That's probably where I've made my biggest mistakes. It's where my gut even said, this is a question mark. 
and I thought I, I need to hire fast and so I'm going to give this person a chance and and as you know the unfortunate thing about hiring the wrong people is that everyone suffers you yes. know because it's a team invested in them and grooming them and educating them and then there's the risk of them meeting clients and so I, that's why you know but i do tend to be too cautious sometimes and so sometimes when i try to fix that i have made hiring mistakes and what what type of mistake did you do you, you heard things that uh, were nicer than they really are the personality type was either um, is yeah, I can I can think of a few. Sometimes people like for this particular company, which is in the cloud space, um, I'm pretty open minded about hiring people that haven't done the exact same thing, mm -hmm. as long as they have like a technical acumen. Uh, for the sales jobs in this company, you know, we work with sales engineers. So obviously, the sales engineers that we hire, they have to be super geeky, as I call it. But this, the salespeople need to be able to speak in generalities about the technology, but they really need to be uh, great salespeople and know how to bring other people in when they don't, yeah. you know. And so some of them just had not called on the right space. For instance, they were, they'd called more in the, on marketing leaders. In our company, we're calling more on sales engineering leadership, IT. And somehow it just wasn't a match. So, um, and sometimes people, it's, it's actually, I mean, I look at myself as one of those people that is tech, just technical enough to be dangerous, but I know when I need help. Yeah. And, and I, I think actually, because I don't know the technical answers, it has enabled me to answer to excuse me to create questions that are more broad and really have to pay attention to the answers because I don't know the answer myself. If you you know what I'm saying, if you I, are, I, I do because I, I always sold super technical stuff. I had a technical background and I'm selling to super technical people, but I didn't need to know the product. I never learned how to demo it, but. I could go by myself and talk to a senior architect. Right. You get the why behind the why. Exactly. Exactly. If you don't know the answer, then you're not, you're not like answering for them. And I, I always say the secret to my success is that I don't know enough. You know, I, I so I, it forces me to be present, right. Yep. And listen, and also, I think because I've been in like eight different industries, several software, but eight distinct industries, I, I have, that's something else I look for is some sort of feeling of credibility or trustworthiness. It doesn't have to be that you're an expert on that thing, but credibility because you know the company, you know their competitors, you, you know something, you can give awesome. them that. That yeah. trusted advisor vibe. It, yes. you know, it doesn't have to be in one in their domain. It could be in, you know, how do their competitors, without telling them their competitors, you know, best practices. How do other people do things? So you have to find your strong suit and get that that uh, trusting relationship, or you're you're not going to be successful. I think. How about the key thing I always found was very few salespeople understood how companies buy. Yes. They're, yes. They're, they're good at the or, taking an order, processing a lead, showing up for a presentation, winning a POC, giving a proposal. But then if it gets stuck, they don't know. Yes. Yeah. So, so interesting, my approach and also the way that I try to coach people is, um, is I, I call it the karate kid approach. Remember that movie? Wax on, wax off. <laughs> wax, yeah. So, so, um, you know, I try to like teach them to do certain, one of the things I like is think about the blank piece of paper and what's your goal at the bottom of the paper. 
That's how I started several of these verticals. And in this case is how do I get, how do I have a win-win relationship? It's not just about getting a deal. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, and then part of, so the answer is the, the winning, right? Or the, the relationship, how do you get to it? Who are the decision makers? What is the process? What is the timing? And be realistic, right? I try In the to, quarter. You know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, I think a lot of as junior salespeople are absolutely not realistic about the sales yeah. cycle and, and, um, and so that's part of the learning, right? But, but, but you're right. I, there's so many things to learn. And I think some of it does take time. Well, what would you have done differently if you had to do your career all over? I would have taken more risks earlier. Yeah. Uh, I definitely felt the need to prove myself for too long in certain jobs. Um, yeah, I think I got in my own way. I was definitely, you know, not confident enough early on. Um, but I definitely stayed true to myself, so I'm okay with that. Yeah, I guess I think we all need that type of coaching constantly through our life. Yes. It's painful, yeah. but. Yeah, and I don't think I had it. I did not have consistent. I had great uh, coaching and leaders in the bigger companies, but I think in a smaller company, you're moving so fast that you're on your own sometimes. Yeah. In, you know. And how do you de-stress? How do I, how do I de-stress? Before COVID, um, <laughs> when I wasn't traveling, I was at the gym almost every day. Yeah. And uh, now I take daily walks. But one of my, my, the big things that I've been practicing for about 20 years is yoga. And, um, and I really recommend yoga for salespeople, which sounds very weird because I know everyone thinks salespeople are all super competitive and, and, you know, need to play sports. So I am not a gifted athlete. I'm very active. I ski and I do other things, but I found yoga and you know they call it a yoga practice and i think sales is a practice yes, yes. to me there is a direct correlation between the two and yoga at least a yoga yoga that i do it it focuses on strength flexibility resilience you need all those things to be good in sales and um it focuses on being present. Yes. In, I mean, in the moment. And that, yeah. And that is to me like one of the biggest things is stop thinking about what you're going to say or what they might say. Listen, be present. Um, it also emphasizes leave your ego. They always, my yoga instructor always says, leave your ego outside the door. Yep. And I think that our ego gets in the way of all the time selling, right? Yes. It's all about us. No, it's not actually. It's all about the oh, customer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, you know, it's, it's calming and, um, you know, and you need some of that, but it's given me a lot of confidence and I attribute it to kind of helping me. I used to be a type A and now I'm a type A minus after 20 years of yoga. <laughs> Yeah. Well, slow <laughs> well it, it loosens you up. And yeah. I like that the practice thing, because I mean, you can learn the poses in a day, can't do them, but you, you know what they are. Yes. Yeah. And, it's also very humbling. It is. <laughs> you can never be perfect. Well, I could never be perfect in yoga. And, and I think I could never be perfect in sales. No, and it's just, to me, it's all part of life. You, I like to keep learning, keep improving. And, um, and so I think you know, sales is a great profession for that. Cool. So. Hey, it's been a fun conversation. Uh, where can people go to connect and follow you? Uh, they're welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Sheila, S-H-E-I-L-A, Aharoni, A-H-A-R-O-N-I. And uh, really appreciate it, Brian. I love what you do. And it's been really fun.